want to first of all say a thank you to Pastor Sonny for allowing me the opportunity to, to come and present God's word with you. We were just be to present God's word. And instantly my thoughts raced to several years ago when we were in seminary school in Michigan. And I remember a seminary teacher telling me that if you're not nervous presenting the word of God, then something's not right with you. And it certainly is a huge task to bring forth God's word to God's people. But yet at the same time, it's very comforting to know that God's word speaks for itself. And it's a privilege to be used by God to present his word, his truths to his people. Uh, I have to say, with a Christmas sermon and a Christmas message, there's one thing that I was kind of hoping for the most while presenting this message, and that was that there would be snow on the ground. <laughs> and for some reason, the snow disappeared between now and last week. So, for Chris, you were lucky enough to have the snow falling and the snow on the ground while you were preaching the Christmas sermon. So that's what I was hoping for. But at least I got some Christmas songs this morning. So that was good to kind of set you Christmas spirit. If you have your Bibles, if you can turn with me, I would invite you to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, we're just going to begin, before we get into anything, the reading of God's Word, very familiar, popular passage of Scripture, especially during this time, this season, Christmas. Luke chapter 2, I want to be reading, beginning at verse 8, and we're going to read through verse 14. So, I don't have the verses up on the screen, so hopefully you have your Bibles with you, and you can read along with me. Luke chapter 2, beginning at verse 8, it said, In the same region there were shepherds out of the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the angel of the Lord shone around, around them, and they were fi filled with fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. The Bible says in verse 13, And suddenly there was with an angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying this, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Luke chapter 2, beginning at verse 8. During the Christmas season is, in my opinion, among some of the most powerful, but yet very hopeful words recorded for us in all of Scripture. Oftentimes, as I said, this passage of Scripture is read aloud during the Christmas season as a tradition, but yet, unfortunately, rarely is it hit in the hearts of believers uh, as a reminder of the peace that's established between God and man. For those of you that have been here over the past couple of weeks, or maybe if you've been tuning, at, tuning in online through the podcast, you know that we've been going through a series called The Heart of Christmas. And we've been pondering upon and reflecting upon some of the more common words associated with the Christmas story. And so as I continue to ponder upon some of those words, as I was kind of collecting and gathering my thoughts in the preparation of this message Instantly, my heart raced to the idea of Christ coming from heaven to earth. Obviously, that's kind of a given. That's kind of the pinnacle of the Christmas story. But I thought about the idea and the word Emmanuel and what that meant and what that means. And the idea of God, Christ coming, clothing himself in flesh and dwelling among his people. Emmanuel, God is with us. God with us. But as I continued to reflect and meditate upon the scriptures, I started to think about what it was that Christ brought with him and what he has established in our hearts with his coming. And so finally, that brought me to the idea and to the thought of peace. And so that's what I want to talk about this morning is peace. And specifically, I want to talk about the peace often missing in Christmas, the peace of Christmas often missing. Missing. And the reason I title it that is because what we often hear about peace isn't necessarily the same peace 
What we often hear about peace isn't necessarily the same peace that we read about in the Christmas story. So before before we get into that, let me start by saying that peace is not only a common word associated with the Christmas story, but peace is also a common word that we often read about throughout all in the entirety of the Scriptures, the entirety of the Word of God. And so because of that, it deserves our attention this morning in understanding what it meant when the angel said to the shepherds, and when all of heaven broke loose, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom God is pleased. That's such an amazing and a, and a marvelous statement that deserves our attention this morning in regards to its significance in our lives. So in this sermon, I want to set out, hopefully, to answer three questions. And those questions are this. What does this peace mean? What is the price of this peace? And if I receive this peace, then do I therefore fall under the category, as the scripture in our passage of scripture this morning tells us, do I fall under the category of of those in whom God is pleased with? And so those are the three questions that I hope I will answer this morning in this message. We've all heard the word peace used and tossed around in our conversations from time to time. We've all heard the word peace used in various different contexts amongst various different people. To give some examples, we've all heard of the peace process and the peace that our country is trying to promote as far as our country and her involvement in foreign affairs. Another example, we like to throw up the peace sign. For some reason, more so in pictures than anywhere else. If you're a celebrity or if you've seen a celebrity in a picture, they throw up the peace sign. And somehow that communicates to everybody that views that picture that they are one for peace and that they promote peace. So we have the peace sign. And that's just a part of our culture for some reason. We've heard and we've talked about inner peace And how that there are a lot of ways, plenty of ways that people will tell you in books that you can read on how to obtain and how to achieve inner peace. All these different ways that we can talk about peace. To some people in our society and other cultures throughout the world, when they hear the word peace, they think of the Dalai Lama. The Dalai Lama is one that many look to as someone who's really big into and promotes peace. The Dalai Lama is all about promoting world peace and the way that he says we ought to do this from his own writings, he says that we need to have better interfaith dialogue. And So basically, in other words, what that means is that if all of the different religions in the world would come together and they would sit at the same table and have respect and love and tolerance for one another, then that would go towards world peace more than anything else. In fact, he says that if we can all realize the common denominator to all of our religions is what he calls humanitarian ideals. Or in other words, what that means is that if we could just realize that all of the different religions are all for and basically the same thing, that all of religions are after the same thing and what they're after is what he, is, is, is the improvement of human life or the improvement of human life here on earth, if we can all just get down to that lowest common denominator and stop fighting, then that would go towards world peace more than anything else. And there are people that follow that, and there are people that believe that, and there are people that that rearrange their life according to that philosophy. That's what they think about when they think of peace. We hear about the award given away called the Nobel Peace Prize which is given to the person who, quote, has done the most for the holding and the promotion of peace. So everybody wants peace. Everybody's talking about peace. But the interesting thing about these different groups and about these different people and organizations that are promoting peace is that if you really scratch the surface, what you find is that what they really are are religions, in my belief. Because in essence, what they all are saying is this, our way is Everybody's after peace, and so therefore our methods, our approach, are the best methods and approach to bring world peace. Our goals paints a picture of what, for the most part, heaven on earth could look like. And so therefore, join up with us, get in the cause with us, and help us make the world what it was meant to be. And folks, that's very religious language. That's very religious 
talk. So again, with a lot of these different groups, organizations, and people that are promoting world peace, when you really scratch the surface, what you really get is religion. But folks, when you open up the scriptures, when you open up the word of God, the inspired word of God, and you come to the Christmas story in Luke chapter 2, and you read about an angel who approaches these lowly shepherds in the field watching over their flock by night. And he says to them, listen, you don't have to fear. You don't have to be afraid. Why? Because I have come to you to bring you good news. And this good news is going to result in great joy. And a matter of fact, this good news that's going to result in great joy is available to anyone and everyone on the face of this earth. And here it is. This good news is that on this day, on this night, in the city of David, a Savior is born. And his name is Christ Jesus. And listen, it was that message alone. It was that announcement alone that caused all of heaven to break loose. And it caused that one angel to change into a multitude of angels. And it moved them to a place of adoration to where they spoke out in praise and saying, glory to God in the highest of highs for, bringing, for coming down and bringing peace to the lowest of lows. To everyone in whom God is pleased with. The Old Testament scripture is Isaiah chapter 9. Earlier before what we read in Luke chapter 2 in the Old Testament. Hundreds of years before Christ came. The Old Testament prophets prophesied about this. And Isaiah, in his, in his writings in chapter 9, says, says this. He says, For unto us a child is born. For unto us a son is given. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father. And notice this. Prince of Peace. Prince of Peace. I love that passage. I love that verse. Because it reminds me that the promise of Jesus' is coming is the promise of peace. The promise of Jesus is coming is the promise of peace. Matter of fact, later on in the life of Jesus, as he grows up to become a man and he starts his earthly ministry, there with him were his followers and his disciples. And he said to his disciples, just hours leading up to his death on the cross, in John chapter 14 and verse 27, he says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Peace I give to you, Jesus says. A couple chapters later, in the book of John, but yet in the same hours, Jesus says this, again, to his disciples, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulations, but take heart because I have overcome the world. So when we put all of this together, it begs the question, is the peace that Jesus gives different in all of the ways that we hear about peace all the time. Is there anything different? It seems to be that there is. Is there anything unique? Is there anything special about the peace that Jesus promises compared to the peace that the Dalai Lama wants to bring or that we hear about all of the time throughout the world? And the truth is this. The truth is this. That the peace that Jesus promises is absolutely different than the peace that many are trying to promote. And the irony of things is this, that if we would just accept the Prince of Peace, then ultimately it will bring us one day to the place where we can enjoy the peace that everybody's trying to promote and looking for in all of the wrong places. That's why Jesus says, listen, I'm leaving you with peace, but it's my peace. It's different. It's not as the world gives it to you, but it's my peace. It's absolutely different. Jesus knew of this. He spoke of this during his earthly ministry. For example, in the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 10, Jesus said this, Do not think that I have come to bring peace to earth. I have not come to bring peace to earth, but a sword. You say, well, wait a minute. Doesn't that contradict what we just read in Luke chapter 2 with the angels and their praise and their worship saying glory to God, peace on earth? Isn't there a contradiction between that and what Jesus just said in Matthew chapter 10? Jesus says, do not think that I come to bring peace to earth. He says, no, 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 no. I have not come to bring peace to earth, but as the Prince of Peace, I have brought peace on earth to anyone and everyone who accepts me and who is pleasing to God. 
So he, he, he speaks and he talks about that inevitable division that can be caused by the controversial truths of the gospel. So again, the question is raised. Well, then what is this peace that we read about in the Christmas story? If it's different, Jesus spoke about that, it's different from what the world is promoting, then what is this peace that we read about in the Christmas story? And how is it different from the peace that so many people are trying to promote in this world? And the first point is this that I want to leave with you this morning, is that the peace that we read about in the Christmas story is this. It's the peace that ends hostility. It's the peace that ends hostility. You say, well, what do you mean? It's the peace that tears down the wall between God and man. It's the peace between God and man. You see, because we oftentimes, when we think of the peace that Jesus offers, we oftentimes think of it as the peace that ends our anxiety. That with all of our fears, all of our pain, all of our worries and all of our imperfections, Jesus is just going to come in, he's going to wipe all of that away so that we can finally have true peace. And that's the way that we think of peace. But listen, now don't get me wrong. Understand that having a relationship with God, let me say this, loving and living and following Jesus does some of that. Becoming a Christian over the course of time does improve your relationships with other people. Becoming a Christian over the course of time does give you a motive to work hard and to be a better person. There's some truth in that. Becoming a Christian does, and it should, alleviate some of that inner tension that you may feel in your life. In the long run, certainly, yeah, becoming a Christian does bring freedom from anxiety. That's why the Bible teaches us to not worry about anything but to pray about everything. Okay, But listen to this. The thrust of the Bible never speaks with words such as this. Come to Jesus so that you can improve your life. The thrust of the Bible never speaks with words such as, come to Jesus so that all of your problems and your worries can just disappear right away. Come to Jesus so that you can finally achieve the inner peace that everybody's looking for. The thrust of the Bible never speaks with words such as that. Why? Because there's a universal issue here that we sometimes forget to acknowledge. If the angel in Luke chapter 10 said to the shepherds that I bring you good news of great joy that will be to just a few, just the Western culture, just a certain country, just a certain church, he says this great joy will be for all people. So if this great joy is for all people, then it can't be talking about these certain things. Why? Because not everybody deals with the same things that you go through. Not everybody is living an unfulfilled life as far as they're concerned. Not not everybody feels like they have room for improvement as far as they're concerned. There is another universal issue that presents itself here. And that issue is the issue of sin and guilt. And folks, this sin has caused an eternal separation between God and man. I want you to listen to this verse. You can turn there with me if you want, because this kind of really explains everything I just said. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, just two verses in this chapter. I want you to see this. Romans chapter 8. Look at verse 7 and verse 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 7 says, For the mind that is set on the flesh... Okay, that's speaking of unbelievers. That's talking about those unbelievers whose mind are set on the flesh. Their mind has not yet been renewed. Their mind has not yet been changed, are transformed by the saving grace of God. So the mind that is set on the flesh, what does it say? Is hostile to God. For it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. And verse 8 says, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Hebrews tells us that without faith, it is impossible to please God. It's impossible. So the Bible says over and over, very clearly, that God is not pleased with us. We cannot please God aside from faith. And a matter of fact, to take it a step further, to make it more drastic, aside from faith, we are hostile to God. Aside from faith, we are at war with God. That's what the Bible says. 
So here's the point of all of this. I want you to get this this morning. Until you can see that you're at war with God, you can never be at peace with Him. Until you can see that you are at war with God, you can never be at peace with Him. So you say, well, what does that mean? What that means is this. Come to Jesus, yes. But don't come to Jesus primarily because He's relevant. Even though Jesus is relevant. Come to Jesus, but don't come to Jesus because He's exciting. Even though life with Jesus is very exciting. Come to Jesus, but don't come to Jesus because He's going to help you with all of your issues. Even though over the course of time, with a relationship with Him, He will help you with many of the issues that you face. But come to Jesus only if what we read is true. Come to Jesus if and only if what we read in this story is true. Did God send His Son Jesus to come to earth? To be born of a baby? To grow up as a man? To die on a cruel cross in the place of sinful people like you and I? To resurrect from the dead? To ascend into heaven to where He is now seated at the right hand of God as ruler and king and Lord over all? Is that true? Do you believe that to be true? Do you honestly believe that to be true? And if so, then the only proper response to that truth is to give Him everything you are, to accept Him and to give Him everything you are, or to utterly reject Him and believe it to be a a lie, to be false or a myth. Those are your only two options, to accept Him And to rearrange every aspect of your life around this person of Jesus or to completely, utterly reject him. The only response that could not be reasonable is to fall somewhere in between. To to think that God is somewhat king. To give some lip service to God. To show up on Sunday and to acknowledge God and to worship him but ignore him the rest of the week. That doesn't make sense. You either accept him and give him everything or you reject him and you give him nothing. You are either at peace with God, or you are at war with God, or you are hostile towards God. So back to the original question this morning. How does this peace that Jesus offer, how is it different from all the other ways that we hear about peace and all the other promises of peace? Well, it's simply this. It's different because of this. Jesus, and only Jesus, gets to the very heart of our real need for real peace. Jesus and only Jesus gets to the very heart of our real need for real peace. Jesus gets to the root of it all and He offers us real, sincere, genuine, authentic peace. I love that because we get a clue of that in our scripture this morning in Luke chapter 2. If you could turn back there and we read it again. We read about an angel who appears unto the shepherds and tells them again that he's got great news that's going to give great joy and that it's going to be the fact that in this city, in this day, in this night, a Savior is born, Christ Jesus. But notice this in verse 12. It says, and he gives them a sign. He says, and this will be a sign for you. And this is the sign. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. But notice this next verse. Okay, I find this interesting. After he gives them that sign of a baby in a manger, it says, And suddenly there was with an angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Did you catch that transition? I find that to be a very weird transition, a very drastic transition. I mean, we go from one angel giving these shepherds a sign that's saying, Hey, the sign is this. You're going to find a baby in a manger on a farm. And then it doesn't say over the course of time or over a period of time, but suddenly, just after that, all of heaven breaks loose. And they start praising God and worshiping God and saying glory to God and the highest for bringing peace on earth towards those who God is pleased with. And so what does that mean? I mean, we go from one to the other, one situation, one extreme to the other. What does that mean? That means that somewhere, God's glory and our peace somehow rests in a manger. God's glory and our peace rests in a manger. The angel announces the baby in the manger, and then the angels praise God for his glory and for his peace. 
God's glory and our peace rests in a manger. That brings me to my second point this morning. Jesus' birth is the means of our peace with God. Jesus' birth is the means of our peace with God. So this peace that we're talking about this morning that was announced by the angels here in this passage doesn't come from government action or political power. It doesn't come from some interfaith dialogue, as the Dalai Lama would say. But this peace comes when a baby is born in a manger. This is how it happens. Turn with me to Ephesians. This is how it happens. This answers, hopefully, the second question that I mentioned at the beginning. What's the price of this peace? We understand what this peace is. It's peace between God and man. But what's the price? If Jesus is our means, and his birth is our means for peace with God, what's the price? Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2. Here's the answer right here. Look at verse 12. Paul, writing here to, and he's talking about Gentiles, so if you're not a Jew, this is to you. Verse 12 says, Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Without God in the world. Verse 13 says, But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near, how? By the blood of Christ. For He Himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in His flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of the commandments expressed in ordinances that He might create in Himself one new man in the place of two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God and one body through the cross, thereby killing hostility. I love that passage of Scripture there in Ephesians because it reminds me that it was all a part of God's plan in love to bring all people groups into saving relationship with Him by breaking down the wall of separation between man and God, killing hostility and establishing peace between God and man. God is not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. It was all a part of God's plan to tear down that wall of separation between him and us, to kill that hostility. This peace ought not to be taken for granted. Because this peace came by the birth and by the death of a Savior. It came by the birth and the death of a Savior. Yet I want to tell you this morning that this never took God by surprise. God wasn't shocked by this. He wasn't surprised by this. Again, God has always had a plan. And I love this. This this answers the third question, hopefully. That it was in God's great love that you and I could be here this morning and have the most core certainty that because we have accepted the truths of Jesus and the fact that He has come and that He died for our sins, that God has made His peace with us. And so because of that, according to what we read in Luke chapter 2, because God has made His peace with us through Jesus Christ, His birth and His death, that we are therefore pleasing in the eyes of God if we have accepted that truth. We are pleasing to God. That's a remarkable truth. Don't skip past that. Sit on that for a while because that is a marvelous truth to know that God is pleased with you. Other translations of the Bible in Luke chapter 2 says, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among whom God's favor rests. That's another remarkable truth, to know that God's favor rests with you. God is pleased with you. One of the most painful things that we go through in life is wrestling with the thought of what other people think about us. And we know that can go to the extreme in living in the fear of man or possibly being addicted to the approval of man. But yet we've all been through broken relationships 
On this side of heaven, there are no perfect relationships aside from God's relationship with us. We all know what that's like. But yet here in this story, our hearts explode with the overwhelming truth that peace with God isn't some journey where somewhere along the way we finally unravel the mystery of obtaining inner peace But because God is a God of love, and because God is a God of grace, seeing our need, He offers us peace with Him freely and fully through the birth and through the death of a Savior whose name is Jesus Christ. And because of that, and through that, God is pleased with you, and His favor rests with you. No matter what anyone else may think of you, God is pleased with you. That's a remarkable truth. I want to end with this story in the Bible. You guys probably have heard the story before. Do you remember that story in Luke chapter 7? Just to kind of set the scene, you can turn there if you want and follow along, but I'm just going to kind of paraphrase and set the scene of that story in Luke chapter 7. But we read about Jesus, and Jesus uh, goes to a guy's house named Simon. Simon was a Pharisee. He was a very religious man. He was well-known in the community. He was a leader of the community, well-respected in the community. And so Jesus goes to Simon's house, the Pharisee, to have a meal. The Bible tells us that they're sitting out in the front yard, which was like a courtyard. Back then in the Bible times, Pharisees were kind of well-off. Their front yard was like a courtyard, which was kind of semi-public, if you will. And people often would come by, walk through, sit down, and have a meal. That was actually a normal thing back then. So here's Jesus with Simon the Pharisee having a meal in the front yard, in the courtyard. And then we're told that a woman of the city walks by. That's that's all we know about her, is that she was a woman of the city. And the one word that was described, that she was described with, was that she was a sinner. She's a sinner. Now that could have been code for the fact that she was an adulteress. She was a harlot, possibly. She had many sins. And everybody knew that. So what did she do? She runs to Jesus, and she immediately falls on her knees. And she begins weeping. And as she's weeping, her tears are falling on the feet of Jesus. Okay? And she takes it another step further, and she pulls out some oil that she has in a flask, in an alabaster box. And she begins pouring that on the feet of Jesus. Taking it even a step further, she begins wiping up her tears and the oil on Jesus' feet with her hair, washing the feet of Jesus. She doesn't stop there, but she goes on. She begins kissing the feet of Jesus because she knew that this man said he could take away her shame. Now Simon's witnessing this, this whole thing. And you've got to remember, he's a very religious man. And as he's witnessing this scene with the woman crying on the feet of Jesus, wiping oil on his feet, wiping it up and washing it with her hair, kissing his feet, he says to himself, if this man is really who he says he is, if he really is a prophet like he says he is, or like everyone says he is, then he would know the type of woman that, this, that she is. He would know what she has done and how dirty she is and how unclean she is. He would know that if he is who he really says he is. And I love this. Jesus, Jesus says, Simon, I've got to tell you something. He begins to tell a story, and Simon's like, speak, teacher. Say it. Let's hear it. I'm ready for it. So Jesus tells a story, and he says, suppose there was a money collector. And he, and he had two people that were in debt to him. One of them owed 500 denarii. The other one owed 50. Now when none of them could pay him back and pay their debt, this money collector just canceled their debt. Just canceled it. And Jesus says to Simon, which one out of those two do you think loves the money collector the most? Simon's like, well, I'm assuming, I suppose it would be the one that had the largest debt, right? The one that owed 500 versus the one that owed 50. And Jesus said, You have judged rightly. You're right. You're absolutely right. And I love towards the end of that story 
when Jesus, the Bible says, turns to the woman, looking at the woman, but yet still talking to Simon, says to Simon, do you see that woman over there? From the moment that I've walked into your house, you've given me no water to wash my feet, but this woman has wiped my feet with her tears. You haven't poured oil over my head, but this woman has poured oil on my feet and has wiped it up with her hair. When I walked in, you never greeted me with this kiss, but from the moment I've walked in, this woman hasn't ceased to kiss my feet. And Jesus turns to this woman and he says, your sins, which are many, are forgiven. Your sins, which are many, are forgiven. He says, your faith has saved you. So that what? So that you can go in peace. Despite your sin, which are many, despite your shame, which is much, your faith has saved you. So you can go in peace. Folks, there is absolutely nothing that you and I could do to possibly persuade God that we are worthy of this peace that he has to offer other than our complete need for him. And that's really the best news of the gospel. That's really the best news of the good news. Why? Because when we finally realize that the gospel of Jesus is so great, it puts an end to all posing and pretending. If there's one community of men and women that should be so familiar with and so comfortable with their brokenness, it ought to be Christians. Because no one criticizes you more than the cross. The cross says that your need is so big, is so great, that it took the death of the Son of God for people like you. And he was glad to do it. He was glad to do it. You may be here today and you may be broken. You may be here today and you may be full of shame. You may be here today and you may have a list of sins which are many. But folks, if we truly believe that Jesus is who he says he is and we truly believe the story in which we read and we accept that by faith we are pleasing to God and we can go in peace no matter what anyone thinks of us. We can know that God's favor rests with us. He is pleased with us and we continue this life worshiping him, giving everything to him in peace. Father God, Lord, we, we thank you so much, Lord, for this opportunity and this privilege you've extended to us to worship you in spirit and truth, Lord, as to, together in this house as a body, Lord, as a church. Father God, Lord, we all come from different walks of life, different backgrounds. Lord, we all experience, Lord, different things that, Lord, takes a toll on our life, physically, mentally, spiritually. Lord, sometimes it can seem that peace that's promoted in this world, Lord, that seems to pop up during the Christmas season is absolutely absent from our life. But, Father God, we know that your truth is consistent. It stands above everything else that we think or believe Your truth tells us, Lord, that you have sent your only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to come, to be born, to grow up and to die on the cross, Lord, so that we could tear, so that you could tear down that wall between you and us. And so that we can have that peace that passes all understanding and knowing that it will guard our hearts and our minds. Father God, we love you, we praise you. It's all in your glory, for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray.